Hey church, Um, it's my honor this morning to preach to you God's word. Um, I hope you have a Bible. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, please turn to Mark chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 40 to 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, And touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. For a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it. And to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was in, out in desolate places, and people, people were coming to him from every quarter. First, I think it would be helpful for us to know the background of the Gospel of Mark to set the scene for what is taking place when this Gospel was written. The Gospel of Mark was written during the reign of Emperor Nero of Rome. Mark is writing to Roman Christians in Rome during a time of great persecution. What most people don't know is is that Mark is the scribe of Peter. The Gospel of Mark is written from Peter's account. Tacitus, a Roman historian who lived during the time of persecutions, recounted that Nero had falsely accused the Christians of starting a fire that burned Rome. The residents of Rome, who were not Christians, were actually saying the opposite. They were stating that Nero had set the fire to Rome for his own amusement. But Nero put the blame on the Christians, and to punish the Christians, Nero would have Christians dressed in animal skins and then torn apart by wild animals just for comedy at his family villa. Another form of persecution that Roman Christians would be subjected to is that they would be nailed to crosses in order to light his garden. We can see that the purpose of this book in the very first verse of Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel seeks to do two things. Remind Christians who Jesus is, and for those who are non-believers, it is to prove who Jesus is. So let's get into the text. Chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. A leper comes to Jesus, and the imagery is so powerful. He comes and is literally begging. But wait. What is a leper? And why is this man begging? Leprosy is is an extremely contagious disease that affects the skin, causing lumps and discoloration. It affects the nerves and causes disfigurement and deformities. It can cause crippling of the hands, feet, paralysis, and blindness. According to the Old Testament law in Leviticus 13 through 14, it tells us about leprosy. In verses 40, in chapter 13, verses 45 through 46, and you can turn there, it says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear, wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Well, now we know why this man is begging. He is unclean. And and that means he is cut off from the people. He has no job. He lives alone. He is alone. He hears that Jesus is in town, so he decides to try to find Jesus. Remember that according to Old Testament law, he is ordered to live outside of the town because he is unclean. According to one commentator, a leper had to stand at a distance of 50 footsteps. If a leper went into a home, then he contaminated the home. 
If a leper stood underneath a tree, then anyone who walked underneath the tree was polluted. Can you imagine this? Either this man had the bravery to quietly go unnoticed into town, or he had to do the most humiliating thing and shout, unclean, unclean, in order to warn others that he was approaching. This man is desperate. He approaches Jesus not standing before him in a posture, but in a posture of begging and on his knees. And he, said, and he says, if you will, you can make me clean. The man has faith in Jesus that Jesus can make him clean. How does Jesus react to this man? Does Jesus shout, unclean, unclean? No. Does he move away from the man? No. Does Jesus say, you are shameful, get away from me? No. Jesus is moved with pity. The, de the biblical definition of pity is to be moved with compassion or to be moved as in one's bowels. The Jewish idea is that the bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. The, one author explains it literally, literally refers to the insides of a person, the guts. Jesus then extends his hand and touches the man and says, I'm willing, be clean. Think about the action of Christ. People would run away at the sight of this leper in order to not be polluted, contaminated, to be unclean. But Jesus initiates he extends his hand out, and he touches the man. Jesus, who is perfectly holy, without sin and shame, touches this man who has sin and shame and cleanses him. One commentator says that Jesus has contagious holiness. I would encourage you with this. Jesus does not move away from you in your sin, uncleanliness, and shame. Jesus moves towards you in compassion, mercy, and love. One author writes, his heart yearns for you. Out of his heart flows mercy out of ours unwillingness to receive it. We think our sin and shame are too much. We have our arms closed. Jesus has his arms open. Jesus' desire to heal you and make you clean. Jesus' desire is to heal you and make you clean. Hebrews 2.11 says, He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. The grace, mercy, and love of Jesus is greater than your sin and shame. Jesus can make you clean. It is who he is. He lives to make you clean. There's a children's song that I love. Um, it's by Shy Lynn. I actually love it. Um, it's, it's called uh, Penelope Judd. And it, it kind of goes like this. There was a little girl, and her name was Penelope. And she was from a town called Mud. Everyone was covered in mud. Penelope was very sad because of, this wor because of the world and how people treated her bad. Everyone hurt each other. They lied, stole, and cheated to get what they wanted. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They were all very sinful. Deep down in her heart, she hoped that things would get better. One day, Penelope received a letter from her grandfather that stated that she was invited to the prince's party. Penelope couldn't believe it. Penelope packed her bags and was on her way. She started to wave goodbye to her friends and they began to laugh at her. She began to have doubts. But then she began to think to herself, why would I want to stay? I just play in the mud all day long. So she started her journey. She got to the, the, to the palace and rang the bell. A man answered the door and asked, can I help you? Penelope said, I have an invitation to the prince's party. The man looked at her and said, I'm sorry. There's no way that I can let you through these doors. The king won't let anyone dirty up his floors. Penelope didn't understand. So the man pulled a mirror out of his pocket 
And for the first time, Penelope saw that she was dirty. The palace was spotless, and she knew that she was unworthy and she was ashamed. Penelope began to walk away with her head down, but a voice inside the party said, You can let her in. The next thing that Penelope knew was that the prince was at the door. He smiled and said, There's room for one more. He reached out and touched her, and instantly she was made clean. All her sin was turned to honor, and she wore the brightest white robe she had ever seen. Penelope asked the prince, Where did you get this robe? The prince said, Actually, it's mine. He led her in through the palace doors, and there she lived with the prince forever. We all have sin and shame, friends. We are all covered in the mud of sin. Our greatest need is to be made clean. Do you see that as your greatest need? What do you see as your greatest need? Is it something in this life? Let's continue on in verses 43 to 44. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. So there are two commands that Jesus gives to the man. First is that the man says nothing to anyone. So a good question to ask here is why did Jesus tell him to say nothing to anyone? Well, we need to climb inside the Jewish mind for a moment. Throughout Israel's history, they thought that the Messiah would be a military ruler that would overthrow the Romans and he would be king. So the reason why Jesus is telling this man not to say anything to anyone is because he doesn't want there to be a false representation of who he actually is. You have to think through this. Jesus has just started his ministry and has done miracles. The Jewish people have this idea of who the Messiah is and, is G and Jesus really doesn't want people declaring him king and ruler of Israel. People don't yet understand why he has come. The Apostle Paul mentions in Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So again, the Jewish people didn't understand why Jesus had come. But it says that he has made, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose as a plan for the fullness of time. The entire plan of God was to send his son, Jesus. This is, this is the mystery that is to be revealed. From the beginning, Adam and Eve sinned, and because of their sin and shame, they were cast out of the garden. Adam's sin and shame became our sin and shame because we are descended from Adam. Before time even began, God the Father made a covenant with God the Son that the Son would save and rescue his people. But the world did not know this. It was a mystery. The mystery is revealed in a rescue mission of God's people. God wants his people back. He wants his church. He wants his bride. In Mark chapter 1, things are just now starting to be revealed. So Jesus is now telling the man not to say anything to anyone. That is completely understandable. Again, they don't have a good understanding of who he is. In the world today, there are many different types of Jesuses. There's the Mormon Jesus. The Mormons say that Jesus is the literal offspring of Father God and one of his goddess wives in the pre-existence. They say that he is the spirit brother of Satan. There's the Jehovah's Witness Jesus. They say that Jesus is the angel Gabriel. There's the Jesus of Islam. But Islam denies that Jesus denies the deity of Christ. 
And they say that Jesus, the Son of God, to say that Jesus is the Son of God is blasphemous and denies the possibility of Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross. Just, it's not true. They, they, they think it's not true. Then there's the Jesus of Catholicism. It affirms the person of Christ as the Son of God, but Jesus' perfect sacrifice is not for, sufficient for sin to be atoned for, but it is grace plus your works. Works like baptism, they think it cleanses you from original sin. So it is only by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone that we are saved. Church, an important application of this text is that we need to be very clear of who Jesus is. We need to be very careful of which Jesus we believe is true. There is only one true Jesus. There are absolute truths in this world. There are no, there are no, there are no relative truths. Two plus two will always equal four. Believer in Christ, we need to test all things according to the word of God. You need to read and study your Bible. Read good books on Christian doctrine and Christian theology. A former pastor of mine said, a reading Christian is a growing Christian. We need to be extremely clear, to, clear about who Jesus is to our family, friends, and co-workers. We need to continue to grow in our understanding of who Christ is and let it grow our affections for Christ. Do you have a clear understanding of who Christ is? Or are some things from your background clouding your understanding? Sometimes we let our traditions get in the way of what the Word of God says, who Jesus is. Test everything, friend. Test me. What I'm saying up here is not true. Please correct me. One thing in this life that we will have to get correct, and the most important thing that we have to get correct, is who the person of Christ is and what he did. Your eternity is dependent upon it. Guests that are here, if you're a Catholic, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, Muslim, Hindu, or you identify from another religion, please know that you are so welcome here. We want you to continue to come back to hear the preaching from God's word. If you're interested in talking about Christ more, then I would encourage you to talk to me or Nico after service. The next command that Jesus gives the man in verse 44, go show, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. The second command that Jesus gives the man is go to the priest. Jesus directs the man who is now clean to go to the priest and show himself then to offer what Moses commanded for proof to them. Why did Jesus do this? Well, according to Jew Jewish Old Testament law, a leper who was cleansed needed to go to the temple and to the priest in order to be declared or announced clean. It doesn't mean that the man wasn't made clean. The man was clean. But Jesus is honoring the law by having the man go show himself to the priest. Jesus is not going to contradict what God's law says. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. The man showing himself to the priest was a very detailed process. And we find the beginning of this process in Leviticus chapter 14. If you'll turn there, Leviticus chapter 14. We'll start in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then, if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed, Two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. 
He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird into the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. He shall then sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall be pronounced him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. We'll stop there. Let's continue to read in verse 45 of Mark 1. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. The man didn't do what Jesus told him to do. He actually did the exact opposite. He spread the news about what Jesus had done for him. Now, I don't want to focus on the man's disobedience of, of, of Jesus' command. I think that if I were that man and I were alone for that long, I would probably do the same thing. But what I do want to focus on is to the fact that it had on the position or the location of Christ. Jesus could not enter a town, but he was out in the desolate places. And people were coming to him from every neighborhood. I want us to remember back to the leper of where he came from. The leper came from outside of the city. The leper was in the desolate places according to Old Testament law. He was outside of the camp, cut off from society. But Jesus cleanses him, cleans him, so the man is running around telling everyone the news of what Jesus did for him. So where is Jesus? Jesus is now in the desolate places outside of the camp. There's a switch that takes place. The man is now clean and is now able to enjoy being in society. He's able to enjoy the benefits of being made righteous and clean. Jesus takes the place of the leper and is now in the desolate places. This is pointing us to the gospel. We are in desolate places. We are unclean. Jesus sees our uncleanliness. He reaches out to us. He initiates. He moves towards us in our uncleanliness, in our shame and sin. And you know what he does? He trades places with us. He takes our uncleanliness, our sin, our shame, and places it upon himself. He becomes our sin and shame. He bears our iniquities. He did this by dying as a perfect sacrifice on the cross for your sin and shame. Just like the two birds that we just read in the Old Testament law. One was sacrificed and killed. The other was dipped in the blood of the slain bird. The blood of the slain bird covers the bird that is alive. The living bird flies away. It is free. It is rescued. The Old Testament law, in the Old Testament law, God is pointing us to the mystery rescue plan revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' perfect and righteous blood can cover you. He can make you clean. After Jesus made his perfect sacrifice on the cross, he rose again from the, from the dead three days later. Why is the resurrection significant? Because it was God the Father approving what his son had done. He lived a perfect life according to God's law. He died for your sin and shame. And to affirm these things, God raised his son from the dead. It is like a stamp. Approved. Everything that Jesus said and did is true. What is your response? It is the response. It should be the response of the leper. The leper came kneeling and begging to be made clean. The man that had leprosy was reconciled to society. You, like the, the leper, recognize you, that you have a problem, that you're covered in the mud of sin. Your problem is sin. Your sin separates you from God. 
No matter how many good works that you do, you can't work yourself to God. You need perfection. You need the perfect life of Christ. There's nothing that you can give Jesus. He has everything. All of your good works have sin attached to them. But when you are given the gift of faith to believe, and you are given grace to repent of your sin, and you see your great need for the righteousness of Christ, there's a trans- transaction that takes place. Your position, just like the leper, changes. You are taken from a dead spiritual person to a person who is made alive spiritually. Your position is that you go from an orphan to a son or daughter. You are adopted, and your position is now in the family of God. When Jesus cleanses you, he reconciles you back to God. When he cleanses you, you are given robes of white. When he cleanses you, he gives you new life. When he cleanses you, he gives you a new heart and a new mind. When he cleanses you, he gives you his righteousness. When he cleanses you, he gives you his crucifixion. When he cleanses you, he gives you his resurrection and eternal life. When he cleanses you, when you die, he gives you glorification. Oh, friend, be reconciled to God. Believe upon Jesus to make you clean from your sin and shame, and he will be moved with pity because he loves you. He willingly makes you clean. Believer in Christ, give praise to him for making you clean and taking all of your sin and shame. I don't think we really understand the significance of what he experienced. The separation from the Father. Rejoice in being free from sin and shame. And one day we will be with our Savior, enjoying him forever. Let it stir your affections. Let's pray.